We'll jump into the message. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, it is with immense gratitude, a blessing that you have given me to be part of this church family. And so we just want to pause for a moment before diving into your word to once again invite you to be with us. We're about to start a new year, 2024, in the, in, in the first few weeks of this year. And we want to do so by setting the pace with communion for our hearts and our minds to be consecrated to you. We're so grateful uh, for what your son Jesus has done for us. And we're asking for a new vision of Jesus in our life. We're grateful that Jesus has placed us on his invite list to be here this morning to participate in the table that you've prepared for us. And so we ask that you will engage our minds and address our hearts now as we go to your word that it will speak deep into our hearts by asking in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. How how many of you have um, ever seen or are familiar with an invite list? Have you, you seen an invite list before? How many of you know what an invite list is? Only a few names. Oh, mercy. Let me tell you in brief. An invite list is a list of the people that you invite uh, to an event, maybe a social gathering. You know, it was about 28 years ago that Anna and I, we decided to get married, at which time I learned a lot during that engagement, um, one of which was the invite list. Uh, I learned, for example, the significance of an invite list. Uh, so Anna and I, we had our own list that we put together, that we made up. It was a good list. I thought it was rather comprehensive. And also our parents put together their own list. And my mother-to-be made a list as well. And she made the mistake of showing us, you know, her list. And when we looked at it, uh, we, were, we were like, who are all these people? You know, and, and, and she's like, well, you know, these are friends, church members, you know, and we, well, we don't know them. We don't, we don't know them. Yes, but they're really good people. Uh, and, and so, and, and we looked at her and we looked at each other and we said, but this is our wedding. You know, and that's when I learned something. When it comes to a wedding, the invite list is finally determined by whom? By, yeah, I shouldn't even ask that question. I should just state it. I just state it as a declarative. It, it, it's determined by the groom and the bride. And, and this is a very important lesson, especially when it comes to get, especially when we come together as a church family to, to come around this table to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And when, it com- when we come to the table, we come perhaps with a variety of different questions. Uh, maybe questions, at least in our mind, or at least maybe in yours, question that maybe is the key question here this morning, which is, who gets invited? Who gets invited? It's not a small question, uh, because it has a range of different responses. For one, it's, very Im- it's a very important question, because for us this morning, when we come to the table, it's just a rehearsal. It, it, it is a rehearsal dinner. What kind of dinner did I just say? It's a what dinner? It's a rehearsal dinner. You see, the wedding supper of the lamb is what ultimately matters here, folks. You see, those who accept the invitation here and now, present, are on the invite list there. You accept your, that, that invite now, it transports, it, it, it connects with the list there. So it matters who gets invited. Furthermore, when you look at history, I mean, throughout Christianity, for more than 2,000 years, people have fought over who gets invited to the table. In fact, some people have said, anyone you want, you get in. Anyone wants to be invited, they get invited. Others have responded, oh, no, 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 sir. 
only those who belong get invited. Some have said, no, no, you have to be good enough. You have to deserve it to be invited. And yet others have responded, but wait a second. Didn't Jesus say, I came to what? I came to call sinners, not the righteous. And so, of course, some have wanted to kind of roll out the welcome mat while others have locked the front doors. So it's, it's a legitimate question. Who is inv- who's on the invite list and who decides who will come? Table fellowship, believe it or not, as we prepare our minds this morning, was extremely important during the first century. In fact, in the time of Jesus, I want to share with you just a little glimpse of how important it was during the time of Jesus, what it must have looked like for him. So I want you to listen to the words of Scott Barchi. He's an emeritus professor at UCLA where he specializes in the ancient world. And he kind of unpacks what it would have looked like during the first century where Jesus lived and worked. And so I want you to listen to these words as Scott Barchi writes during the time that it would have looked like for table fellowship when Jesus interacted with his friends and disciples. Notice what it says. He says this, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship for the cultures of the Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era. Meal times were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at the table for the purpose of eating food with another person have become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Therefore, or thus, betrayal or unfaithfulness toward one another with whom one has shared the table was viewed as particularly reprehensible. On the other hand, when a person was estranged, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation. Everyday mealtimes were were highly complex events in which social values boundaries, statuses, and hierarchies were reinforced. Everyone who challenged these rankings and boundaries would be judged to have acted dishonorably, a serious charge in cultures based on the values of honor and shame. Transgressing these cultures consistently would make a person an enemy of social stability. So does table fellowship matter? Yes or no? It did. And I think it matters even more so nowadays. So my question, who gets invited? I mean, I think that's at the core. Who gets invited? In a world like which Jesus, like we just read, those words, the words that describe who is Jesus inviting really matters. And we have a pretty good idea of some of us, at least, Maybe this morning, probably thinking, maybe should I be here? Should you be there? Sometimes we think that the one that shouldn't be there, it's me. And the other times we think, well, maybe it's you. So what might Jesus, and here's the question, so what might Jesus practice? What he did, what did he do at the time? Is it, is it enough to teach us? So we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke this morning uh, for an answer to that question. We're going to go to Gospel page, num- chapter, I should say, 22. And I'm going to read uh, primarily from the New International Version. But here we go, out of the gate, chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. Luke here describes the words that Jesus is sharing around that table. And, and notice here, in beginning in verse 14, he says, When the hour had come, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly, notice that word, I have eagerly desired to keep the Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So I want to hone in on that word. What was that word I just said? Eagerly. Now, depending on the translation I'm reading from the NIV, you might be looking at others. Uh, it, It can be translated eagerly. Others have earnestly, right? It doesn't matter. The the point is that 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 word is very significantly placed in the context of what Jesus is saying. Because depending on the context, that word, the object that, that is connected to, it can be translated either negatively or positively. Now, if it's negative, it's translated as covered, covetousness or, or lust. If it's translated positively, you'll see it here in the context of what we just read. It can be translated as, Jesus says, an eager desire, intense. It's a a passion of what's about to happen. And so when you look at this, Jesus here is saying, with desire, he says, with desire, I've desired to eat this meal with you before, prior, before I suffer. And so so we can easily conclude, as you're looking at this verse, that everything up to this point, looking at all of the faces around that table, we can conclude that they were intentionally. What word did I just say? Intentionally there. It was not by accident. They didn't just knock on the door and show up by accident. Jesus invited them they were intentionally there jesus with this desire he says he earnestly desires to eat with them had made some key choices decisions about who would join him in that upper room now think about this who was actually there in that upper room who were these faces around the table the first thing we notice is as we kind of peer in, in your mind's eye, as we peer in into that group in that upper room, is that this is really a kind of a, a motley crew of sorts. I mean, this is a ragtag group, really raw. They're largely uneducated. They're, they're unprofessional. They are unable to do much in the world of their day. In fact, th- there is no face in there. Actually, no face at all. Actually, no, no, no. Let me back up. There probably is a particular face that if we were to open up their high school yearbook, we would probably find a picture of them under the designation most likely to succeed. Right? I, I mean, they, they, just, they just don't listen all that well to Jesus. In fact, when they do listen, they tend to forget what Jesus tells them. And many of them would be fighting amongst themselves, elbowing kind of each other, get out of my way, wanting to be there at the side of Jesus, always wanting to be in the forefront, in the limelight, at the top of the pecking order. And, and, you know, and when, we, when we look at this group, there's always that temptation, at least for me, maybe not for you, you know, to look and say to Jesus, Jesus, you may want to vet this list a little bit. You may want to, you know, edit the list, you know, and and I can imagine Jesus looking and saying, this is my party. This is my list. They stay. All right. Well, Jesus, you know, just take a few moments with me. Look around. Look around that table from the experiences and the stories of the gospel You know, look at that one individual there on the side. Everyone was familiar with him, but rather somewhat kind of maybe at odds and at conflict with him most of the time because he was a collector of taxes. His name was Matthew. He was known as the collaborator. See, Matthew was the traitor. He understood that the occupying forces that that held sway of their land, they hated Romans. Matthew collaborated with them. And and so he was always at odds, and and many of the group were antagonistic toward him. 
more likely he actually probably paid for the right to be a tax collector so that he can build his fellow countrymen and compatriots out of their hard-earned money that was being billed to line the coffers of Rome and also line his own pockets. So Matthew was the collaborator. Nobody likes these collaborators, much less the fact that he works for the Internal Revenue Service. You see, and and you say, you know, and you're looking at him and you say to Jesus, Jesus, are you, you sure you want this collaborator here in this room around the table? And Jesus says, my meal, my list, Matthew stays. All right, all right, Jesus. But you look, and, it, 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 and he's probably sitting next to Matthew, if you understand what I mean. You look, and, and you see another individual, Simon. But, but not Simon Peter. It's Simon the Zealot. You know, the Zealot was a technical term, that name Zealot. It was just a technical term. In the world of their day and time, of people that had this mindset that said, we fight to keep our Jewish lands. We fight to keep the temple. We will fight to keep the thought process of our culture, the way we think and the way we do things. We will fight to keep our religion pure. We're not going to have any of this, you know, inbreeding. We're not going to have these half-baked hybrid situations. No, no, no. We want to keep it pure. We will do anything and everything we need to do. We will actually fight. We will suffer intensely, kill if we have to. But we will get rid of these oppressors that are just suppressing us in the land in which belongs to us, promised by the Savior. And so Jesus, you're looking, the zealot? Come on, Really? And he's hanging out there at the table with the tax collector. Jesus, really? And so we will probably go and tell Jesus, watch those two. They're sitting next to each other. We would probably go to Jesus and tell him, Jesus, you need to vet this list a little bit more carefully. Are you sure you want this individual on your list? Are you sure you want him? What do you think Jesus is going to say? My list? My party, my supper, the zealot lives. The the zealot is going to stay. All right, Jesus. All right. What about the one sitting not too far from him across the table there? Simon. You know Simon. Not the zealot, but Simon Peter. I mean, you, you know, Simon Peter was an interesting individual. Because when you look at the scriptures, you look at the New Testament, you can't find anywhere that describes how Jesus probably could have reacted to some of the things he typically did. You know, Simon just couldn't help himself. You know, he, he couldn't stop talking. This individual was, just had this type of personality. And nowhere in the New Testament can you find a verse in the Bible that says, you, you know, that Jesus, you know, just spontaneously told Peter, Peter, shut up. You know, just be quiet, man. You're making me look bad. You know, you, 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 know, you know what I'm talking about? Those moments when... He says things that were just so out of context, where he would open mouth, insert foot. You know, he had that foot and mouth disease, you know, and embarrassing himself, but at the same time, embarrassing Jesus, even on this night where they're around the table. On that night, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Satan has desired, has desired to have you. All of you, actually, not just Simon. And he's going to sift you as wheat. And he is so powerful. He is so powerful that before the rooster crows tomorrow, you will deny me three times, Peter. And truth truth be told, truth to form, Peter says, no, 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 no. No, sir. You know, you see all these other guys, that that zealot over there, those other ones, you you know, Judas. No, no, no. I'm not going to do that. Not me. They can't be trusted. I can. I'll be there with you to the very last moment. I, I'm going to be your, the, the last best hope that you're going to have. I'll stand right beside you and fight to the very end, to the death if need to. 
And Jesus says, I want you to remember those words, Peter. Remember those words the next time you hear a rooster crow in the distance. And we say, Jesus, come on, Jesus. He's going to deny? He, 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 you, know, you know him? Are you sure you want him on the list? And Jesus says, my meal, my list, Peter stays. Well, they're going to let every, anybody, you know, who, whomever, just open up the doors. All right? But yet, as you're looking, your eye falls on the one seated next to the host. The one who's pictured there to be most likely to succeed, sitting next to the one who's hosting the dinner. He's nicely dressed, refined, polished, slick as all get out. He's well dressed. He has a money bag, a portfolio. He's got his hand on the money. And Jesus speaks to him as well. Not just to Peter. He speaks to him. The, the man from Kerioth, Jesus Iscariot. He says to him, and Jesus just talks to his heart. He tells him, I know what you're up to. Judas, I know what you're about to do. He, he's, he wants his heart. He wants his heart. And Jesus is trying to reach him. And you're thinking, Jesus, are you sure? Be careful who you invite, who is on this list. You sure you want him on the list? And Jesus says, my meal, it's my party, Judas stays. Now, I'm shaking my head. I wonder about that. Do you? Do you wonder about that? Because more than 2,000 years ago, people will fight over who gets to be at the table. And yet, if it takes Jesus who looks at the list, Jesus saying everybody, anybody at that list, any of us, anybody, even me, even when I fail and mess up, even you, when it, when it comes to having a terrible week or a terrible day and you've given in to your worst temptations, even that person that you keep catching out of the corner of your eye and you wonder, what is that person doing here? What are they, why are they even here in this sanctuary? And you're thinking, why do they even want to be here? What, are they on the list? You know, you sure want Jesus? You sure you want them on your list? And Jesus says, it's my meal. It's my party. They stay. It's actually really quite stunning, isn't it? It's stunning because it's not about this table here. You know, we look at this table. It's really not about that table at all. It's about the wedding supper of the Lamb, the grand table. We're talking about this great wedding. We're eating at the true banquet, because you see, this is just the rehearsal dinner that we're doing here this morning. That's the difference. The difference is that the wedding and that grand banquet table is yet to come. This is now the rehearsal dinner in which those who are participating are giving their RSVP to that supper. In other words, you come, you participate now. You're saying, Jesus, I am responding to your invitation. I want to be on that invite list, the one to come, you see. And what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, we're reminded when we eat and we drink of what he did in the past. But there's also another component of what happens in the future. And when you participate in that and you wake up to the reality that you are now responding to that and saying, Jesus, I got your invitation. I want to be on that invite list. That's what matters the most, folks. It matters the most because remember, the rest of your life will be in response to the decisions that you make, even now on a quarterly basis. Because Jesus, how did he say it? He said it quite plainly, didn't he? He said, I have eagerly. I have earnestly desired to eat this meal with you before I suffer. But then continue on that verse. 
in verse 16, he says, I shall never eat it again until we eat it before again in the kingdom of God. He's waiting for that marriage supper, that wedding feast, that banquet, when he will eat it with you. It's a gratitude with an RSVP. And it's just incredible for anyone who wants to come. So if you're tempted to tell Jesus to vet that list, to look it over more carefully, just remember what he says. It's my meal. It's my wedding. It's my invite list. And anybody who wants to come can come. 